It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see so many people here. Once again, this strange, magical moment when we come together again, or perhaps for the first time. You, having come from wherever you came from, me, having come from uh, the slopes of the world's largest active volcano, actually, but via Manhattan and Austin last uh, weekend. And the purpose of these things is sort of to check the state of the condensing collective understanding about what is going on in the world or what might be going on in the world. Uh, this, it seems to me, is the subject worth talking about. What is going on? How can you find out what is going on? How do you know when you've found out what's going on? Can one know what is going on? And uh, my involvement with this is no different from your own. A sincere desire to untangle these questions before the yawning grave closes over the enterprise and the entire thing becomes moot. One has, you know, a window of opportunity somewhere between zip and a hundred to solve or understand or penetrate or appreciate or come to terms with the conundrum of being, this amazing circumstance in which we find ourselves, both individually and collectively. Collectively, we find ourselves, you know, somewhere between the slime and the archangels, making our way perilously over the millennia, up the evolutionary ladder toward the platonic light or something like that. At least this is the myth of intellectuals uh, of the high-tech industrial democracies evolved over the past 150 years, the triumphant ascent of organic life toward ever greater complexity. Individually, we each find ourselves born into a culture we had no share in designing, but that we will be expected to inhabit, inculcate, and in fact pass on uh, to our own progeny. And so this is our uh, circumstance, I think, individually and collectively. Thrown into being, Heidegger said. Uh, we didn't ask for it. Here it is. What are we to make of it? And obviously, if you toured the halls of this exhibition, uh, we are to make much of it and money of it. Uh, the, the, these two principles uh, seem to emerge. Uh, that uh, there is much to be said, many ways to slice the pie, and, uh, and the market economy is a very fertile uh, domain in which to thrash this all out. You can sell your answers, you can trade your answers, you can upgrade your answers, uh, you can subscribe, serialize, retrofit, export, import, and uh, reinvent answers. Ultimately, I wonder uh, how satisfying all this is. And I, I'm always amused at my own position in this situation. Uh, I'm... It's a great pain to the tolerance of the new age that they keep inviting me back. I'm, I'm sort of like the crazy uncle, or, you know, you, you hope for good behavior, but you understand that uh, uh, it's a gamble. Because I'm very, um, I'm very ambiguous about, uh, about much of the methods and ways by which we do our intellectual business and pursue the matter of, uh, of community and salvation. 
the, the intellectual tension that seems to work its way through this society almost like fat through meat is the tension between scientific reductionism and the deeply felt intuition of most people that there is a spiritual dimension or a hidden dimension or a transcendental dimension. And of course, downloaded into language, it becomes easily ridiculed. And downloaded into tasteless language, it should be ridiculed. Uh, uh, but so when we try to formulate our spiritual intuitions, they, they are inevitably, I think, tainted by what we bring to it. And I was struck as I moved through the hall, it, it was almost like an exhibition of language types as much as an exhibition of products or, or possibilities. What were being sold were closed systems of jargon, which once opted into tended to produce answers in a short loop of uh, possibilities. All... Uh, closed systems of thought are like this. And to my mind, at the, what seems to me, very elderly age of 50, and I know to some people in the room it does seem very elderly, and to others I seem a pup. But anyway, uh, from this vantage point, it seems to me that all of these ideologies are uh, cartoon-like. They flatten, they simplify, they betray, they amuse, which is also cartoon-like. And in amusing, I think that this is where their health-fulfilling and uh, salutary worth lies. They are intended to provoke a small smile. That smile will uh, lift you a little further up the ladder, the rungs, of the ladder of being. So I thought today what I would talk about is some of the conclusions that I've come to out of a life of psychedelic voyaging, living inside this insanely contradictory uh, society, and uh, going through the standard moves, marriage, divorce, children, career, controversy, allies, enemies, attorneys, counselors, consultants, accountants, so forth and so on, the same world you live in. What have I... Uh, well, the first thing I concluded was to try and flee it, uh, which I did a pretty good job of by going to Hawaii, which, believe me, is a private Idaho. But the, the conclusions that I've reached uh, are not politically correct anywhere. And so I'm very happy to offend everyone because that seemed to be what I did uh, best and there's no sign of mellowing at this point. Uh, so the conclusion that I reach vis-a-vis -vis the individual and uh, civilization is this. Culture is not our friend. Culture is not your friend. It's not my friend. It's a very uncomfortable set of accommodations that have been hammered out over time for the convenience of institutions. A young man gets his first dose of the news that culture is not his friend when uh, told that he's going to be given an air ticket and some training and sent to an exotic country to kill its inhabitants in the name of some political ideal. You have to be fairly dense not to get the message at that point that culture is not your friend. It is using you for its purposes. You would never dream of doing what it now proposes as the only conceivably right and righteous course of action. Well, that's, you know, a black and white, a stark and enormous 
example of what I'm talking about. But I think every day, in thousands of ways, we betray our impulses toward wholeness, toward community, toward freedom, toward the spirit, by genuflecting uh, two cultural values that are squirrely or toxic or simply wrong-headed or obsolete. Uh, culture is not your friend. It's an illusion. Uh, what kind of an illusion is it? And this sort of leads on to my, the other thing I've come to. It's a childish illusion, is the kind of illusion it is. Recently I had a physical examination with my doctor, and after it was all over, he leaned back in his chair and he said, well, you know, most people your age in the 19th century were dead. Uh, yes, quite true. Uh, people live a great deal longer in the 20th century. And consequently, I think we, uh, part of what drives alienation is it, it's like being, culture is like being taken in a crap game. If you play long enough, you will figure out that you're being screwed. And, of course, if you die shortly into the game, it never enters your mind. We are all, uh, some of you may have seen the little saying that hangs behind bars in Minnesota, we get too soon old and too late smart. Well, some of us are getting smart earlier and earlier. And what is seen through to them is the fact that culture victimizes, ideology victimizes. These things are all con games. Reality, a culturally defined reality, is some kind of an intelligence test. And those who are joining are failing the test. Uh, this is very clear to me looking at... Uh, well, phenomena like alien abduction and uh, uh, the great enthusiasm for conspiracy theory that now seems to attend so much modern thinking. Again, these are epistemological cartoons where low production values made acceptable through tolerance of TV is allowing people to accept uh, material into their own story which should actually end up on the cutting room floor. Uh, uh, everything, nothing, is what it appears to be. Surely you've noticed that. That's, that's A, right? A is nothing is what it appears to be. Well, therefore, complex, difficult, tricky, and mercurial things are even less likely to be what they claim to be than other forms of reality. So, confronted with the endless whispered rumors and doctored photographs and uh, breathless testimony from the denizens of trailer courts and so forth and so on. What is one to make of all that? Well, I think what you're... It, it's, uh, the message is return to basics. The information matrix has become compromised. The data stream is now suspect. Return to first principles. What are first principles? <laughs> that, that's what the 20th century is trying to figure out. Yes, what are first principles? I'd like to suggest to you that a place to begin is the body. You have one. It isn't ideologically defined. It can be ideologically defined. Uh, you know, in Catholic school, the nuns used to tell us we should dress in darkness so we wouldn't be an occasion of sin to ourselves. That's an example of the body becoming ideologically uh, defined. But it, it precedes culture. Culture has to deal with the fact that your eyes are on the front of your face and your anal pore is located near your genitals. Culture would probably rather have it some other way. It would 
be so convenient, but hey, it's a given. Uh, I'm so happy we don't, our rumps don't swell in estrus the way some of the other primates do. Can you imagine Giorgio Armani uh, trying to create a line of fashion that comes to term with that? But I, but I digress. So the the body, the body is a pre-cultural given, and coming with the body is this amazing thing which everyone wants to give away, throw away, get away from called the felt moment of immediate experience. The felt moment of immediate experience. This is you, now, here, in your body, with the cheeseburger slowly dissolving, the cup of coffee, the caffeine, the, the, the bladder, all of these things, collisions, Concrescences, the crossing of trajectories of mental process, digestive process, metabolism, intent, income, emotional state, the felt presence of immediate experience lodged in the body-mind system in the moment. That's who you are. That's what they can't take away from you, whether they drag you away to prison, beat you, drug you, whatever they do to you, you will still have some kind of felt presence of experience until you drift into the darkness uh, of non-entity. So there then, one can begin to build outward from that core and say, aha, so the stuff of understanding is not information passed by culturally validated coding systems among the primates at high chatter rate. In other words, the truth is not in the public space or the historical space. The space is, the truth is in the felt space of the body in the moment. Well, so some great religions have gotten this far. Uh, and they, uh, whatever they are, and there are many of them, uh, come at last to advocate something called meditation, which has many guises and travels under many names and methods. But what it primarily is, is attention to attention. Uh, and what it primarily reveals in, um, in the ordinary metabolism is uh, frankly, bloody little. Uh, good meditators will tell you how incredibly boring it is. And the rhetoric of the religions that have made meditation the centerpiece of their ontology is a rhetoric of nihilism. I mean, this is, you know, oh, I should have said nihilism. Because this is sort of the, the dirty little secret of Buddhist ontology. It isn't the cheerful new Buddhism being exported from California. It's the old style Nagarjunian Buddhism that says, you know, it is an emptiness within an emptiness, after an emptiness, before an emptiness. This is Nagarjuna on the nature of Bodhi mind. Uh, but, Interestingly, uh, meditation pursued not for years or lifetimes, but pursued as a cultural project over centuries, uh, leads not to a clarifying of this philosophical emptiness, but to a discovery that the depths of nihilism, the depths of non-entity, are, uh, in fact, multiferous in their aspects. Not a plenum is what I'm grasping for. Not a plenum, not an undivided platonic thing, but an environment of spirit, meaning, power, intentionality, entities, intelligences, levels, swarming, 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 in the imagination. And these things can be accessed uh, through uh, drugs, through extraordinary physical practices or ordeals, 
through uh, various kinds of driving of physiological systems like sonic driving through drumming or physiological driving through repeated chanting. And then the ordinary boundaries of culture and of body dissolve into a much larger realm, the imagination. And it is this imagination that I think is the place to put our attention. The imagination is a dimension of non-local information. Quantum physics is now moving towards securing the idea that in some kind of a mathematical superspace, all particles in the universe maintain a kind of super state of connectivity called Bell's non-local connectivity. Uh, what this means to me is that the imagination is uh, literally another dimension, a dimension that is non-local. Now, the mind, uh, the animal mind, the human mind, the paleolithic mind, evolved as a um, master coordinator of sensory data coming into the body from the senses about the level of threat and danger in immediate three-dimensional space. That's the mind's evolutionary function, to preserve the body, to preserve the genetic stream of unfolding by detecting and avoiding threat. And so our minds have evolved in the same way that water takes the shape of its container. Our minds have evolved to take the, ta the shape of three-dimensional space and time under cultural, uh, under cultural and environmental pressure. Well, we've paid a huge price for this. It probably also has ensured that we're here this afternoon to discuss it. But it's been a long time since the instantaneous reflex to bash the brains out of anything moving near you that's unfamiliar has served us well. You know, I mean, that, that got old 12,000 years ago. The entire enterprise of civilization has been about something else. The felt presence nearby, ineffable, unsayable, but uncannily penetrating of beauty, of mathematical connectivity, of supernatural power. And so these are the things, the exploration of which, the singing about of which, make us human beings. The exploration of the universe of the unseen is the business of human beings. It's why we are the way we are. It's why we will be the way we will be. It's how we got where we are. How is it done? It's done by dissolving ordinary cultural boundaries, by perturbing consciousness, and by paying careful attention to the results and attempting to build models therefrom. Now, in the last few thousand years in the West, this enterprise has been tamed by priestcraft, which combines the enterprise with judicious politicking and a certain amount of ass licking. Before that, the enterprise was untainted by such secular concerns. It was full force forward into the unknown. And this is the great era of shamanism. And what is shamanism but philosophy with a hands-on attitude? Philosophy not made around the campfire, but philosophy based on the acquisition of extreme experience. That's how you figure out what the world is not by bicycling around in the burbs, but by forcing extreme experience. The reason people refer to psychedelic endeavors with the vocabulary of travel, taking a trip, and so on, is because that is an extreme endeavor. 
It's the same endeavor. It's the leaving behind of the values of your own culture. You know, take nothing but a change of clothes, fly to Benares, and take up residence at Dasasamid Ghat among the Charas Sadhus, and I guarantee you, whether you resort to psychedelics or not, uh, you will experience boundary dissolution, a reorienting of categories, and a reframing of your perspective on uh, your life and your being. So extreme experience is the necessary key. This is true in all forms of endeavor. I mean, if you, if you want to understand the atom, you have to smash it. You know, sitting around looking at it, it will never yield its secrets. You have to smash that sucker to bits and then collect the pieces and then examine exactly how it all uh, came apart. In the same way, and without you know, going too far afield for the pun, we must smash ordinary consciousness, get smashed and then look at the pieces flying in all directions and say, you know, gee, I didn't know minds could do that. Uh, well, uh, they can't in the workaday rote of, you know, living inside the little boxes of positivism and constipated behaviorism and all the rest of it. So extreme experiences. But, you know, you don't want these experiences to be too extreme or you will sever the connectivity among the various subsystems and then we'll have to bury you. And this is always a, a huge strain on those left behind. So uh, there is a practical element here, which is, okay, so we want to have extreme experiences, but we don't want to have such extreme experiences that we don't live to tell the tale. Uh, we want control to some degree over these experiences. Well, this is where the um, incredible thoroughness of our human ancestors comes to our aid. Throughout time and space on this planet, our remote, the tribal societies that preceded us made it their business to discover, catalog, and learn to manipulate plants in the environment as the carriers, as the sources of chemical compounds in the environment, which would work extraordinary transformations on consciousness without uh, physical harm, without physiological damage to the organism. Uh, and of all the many techniques, ordeal, abandonment in the wilderness, sexual abstinence, uh, hanging by your pectoral muscles from hooks in the sun for days, uh, all of these sorts of things. Of all of these methods, psychedelic plants and their judicious use is arguably uh, the most effective, the, now get that, the most effective and the least invasive and the most likely to uh, produce negative long-term consequences. Well, this was not news or even controversy anywhere in the world until uh, within the confines of the 20th century, basically, uh, the presence of these substances and plants began to alarm the order-keeping forces of the high-tech industrial democracies. An issue separate from the issue of stimulants and depressants. It's an issue separate from the issue of addiction and dependency. These things are not stimulants or depressants, and they do not cause addiction or dependency. What they cause is what I'm advocating, a fundamental revaluation of cultural values. Because culture, as we are practicing it currently, uh, is um, causing a lot of pain to a lot of people and animals and ecosystems, none of whom were ever allowed to vote on whether they wanted this process to go in this direction. We do not feel what we are doing. Remember I spoke about the primacy of the felt moment of experience. If we could feel what we are doing, we would stop doing it. 
But between us and the consequences of our action, there are endless veils of political rhetoric, stultification, denial, uh, uh, sedation, intoxication, ideological delusion. Now, normally, I I think a rap like this tends to, if you have to pigeonhole it, to come down on the uh, side of pessimism. But I am am not pessimistic. I see everything as though it were integrated and connected, and there is an unfolding and a plottedness about our situation. It's not for nothing that at the very pinnacle of the age of faith in the machine and science and male dominance and projection of strategic weaponry and so forth and so on, that there should come from the gentler societies of the world, from the rainforests and high deserts of the world, the news of these plants. You know, the Western mind, the cataloging mind, the Cartesian mind, its frenzy to locate, list, isolate, and define everything, carried these plants and substances over the past 150 years into the confines of our society, and they are much like Trojan horses, left there by the bedraggled, uh, beat-down, disenfranchised, third-world, shamanic people to be found by the white-coated priests and priestesses of science and to be brought back into the laboratory to be picked apart for their efficacy in treating addiction or overcoming neurotic behavior or something like that.